the sermon scripture this morning is from John chapter 15 verses 1 through 5. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruitful. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I am them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Shall I pray? <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for today and putting your Holy Spirit upon us each one of us here, so may we understand your word and apply it to our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, I'm not a tax expert, but I would like to briefly talk about the history of the U.S. tax system because it is related to my sermon today. And last week, our country fell into a hot debate on the tax plan. And the Senate Financial Committee approved a $1.5 trillion Republican tax overhaul plan. So one group says it's a great plan. It could create more jobs in this country. And, and the other group says, no, it could destroy this country. It's a plan of disaster. I don't know which plan is good or bad. But this is not the first time that our country fell into a hot debate on the taxes. Our country had two historically important moments that shaped the system of the tax in this country. One was 19, uh, 17, uh, 1791, the Whiskey Rebellion, and the second one is the Civil War from uh, 1861 to 1865. 1791, when George Washington was in the office, the farmers in Pennsylvania got angry on the taxes on the whiskey, so they protested against the government. It was actually first uh, imposed taxes on a domestic product by newly formed federal government. At the time, before the whiskey taxes, there was no uh, taxes on any ink or any product in this country. So the farmers in uh, Pennsylvania, a couple of hundred people, protest against the government and they burned down the tax collector's house and killed a few of them. Few of them. After putting the farmers down by military force, our government was divided into two groups. One is, we have to lower the taxes down. And second one was, no, since they messed up this city in Pens of Pennsylvania, we have to keep the taxes. Then 60 years later, we see a similar debate in this country after the Civil War. One, one group says we have to take more taxes from the rich and use the money to build infrastructure. And the second group says, no, we have to lower the taxes so the rich people can invest the money and rebuild this country. So these two events we still can see in today. And since that time, our country is always divided into these two major big events. You know, politician says taxes are like landmines. If a government doesn't handle well, it could make the government upside down. It could create a big crisis. We can see this in our world history today. You know, AD 70 in Israel, the Roman military of 30,000 uh, uh, military 
uh, invaded into Jerusalem and destroyed the wall of Jerusalem. Since that time, the Israel people became diaspora, spreading to New York. And until 1945, they were wandering around in the world for 2,000 years since AD 70. That historical event took place with the one small incident on Texas. Roman government tried to get more taxes from the Jews, and they refused in the first century. This small incident created more riot, then riot became crisis in the country, so the Roman government sent a 30,000 army to destroy the wall of Jerusalem and its temple. That's why we have today in world history, in Israel, it's a chaos. Israel people and Palestinian people, they are fighting, fighting, fighting because 1945, the, the great British just put the Israel in the middle of their land. Israel says 4,000 years, uh, 2,000 years ago, this was our country. So they came, that's, a, that's 1945. Text is very tricky issue. When Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower, when we see this statement, we understand as a spiritual implication that we all have to be in Christ or we have to be removed from Christ. But 2,000 years ago, this statement was heard in relation to the economic circumstances. Now, back in 2,000 years ago, most heavy burden to Israel was taxes. Tax collectors are most hated people. They were vile and corrupt people. They took more taxes from Jews maybe 20-30% more to keep as their personal benefit. So Israel people consider them as corrupt people as low as the unclean animals such as uh, the pig and snake. So the tax collectors were not allowed to enter into the temple and worship God. They were not uh, allowed it to associate other Jewish people because they were corrupt. Corrupt. Vine business 2,000 years ago was much part of a Mediterranean life. It was a big business. Olive and vine and figs were the main trees widely planted in those areas. So the the wine owners were Romans, and Jews were working for the a vineyard. So some bad owner imposed their taxes on their worker, their employee. So Jews had to pay their owner's taxes. That's not fair. So they already got angry on taxes. They, they are not really, they don't know, or don't appreciate the, the wine, the vineyard owner's attitude and tax system. Then Jesus came and said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. When the Jews, when uh, Jesus' disciples hear this statement, the first thing that came into their mind was, Jesus is a good owner who doesn't imp uh, exploit uh, their uh, payment, who is very honest and faith uh, faithful and treat us with the fair uh, payment that they deserve. So this is very important statement. It's not just a spiritual implication that you have to be with me. You have to be inside of me so you are not able to remove. We should look at the beyond. This is a real life setting teaching. When Jesus said this statement, the, the disciples understood 
That's my life. The people who heard Jesus' statement in chapter 15 see that, oh, that's my life too. This is a real life setting. Jesus needs to teach this lesson at this particular moment of his ministry in order to show them that Jesus is the one who understands what they are going through. Jesus is the one who sees their suffering and pain. Jesus is the one who truly provides what they need. Jesus needs to teach this lesson to the 12 disciples. You are with me. I am the true vine. As long as you are stay with inside of me, you are protected. You are uh, you are taken care of. I will give you whatever you ask for. Stay inside of me. This is the lesson that the disciples really need to hear. You know, when I was in college, I was all by myself. I just came from South Korea and I didn't know anyone. Especially Thanksgiving and Christmas Day, I usually stayed in my place. The one day my friend asked me if I want to go to his, uh, his place for Thanksgiving. So I said, of course, that's great. So I went to his place on Thanksgiving. There were more than 30 people. It's a small uh, country town. Then his mom and dad took care of him like you know, his son. And their son. Then right before Thanksgiving meal, uh, his mom asked me, Jay, would you bless this meal? But at the time, I didn't understand bless mean prayer. I said, okay, I'm going to bless. So inside, I just blessed the meal. Then at the uh, table, uh, 30 people were sitting, and uh, his mom, my mom's friend said, let's pray. So we all closed our eyes. Then it was quiet. I was supposed to pray, but totally forgot. In about the 30 seconds, everyone just you know, opened their eyes and began to eat. Then my friend told me that, wow, that was an awesome, silent prayer, Jay. <laughs> then everyone was just, just laughing. Then that night, since you know, there were so many people, and his mom put me and my friend in a garage. You know, there was some couple of bunk beds. But the later, his cousin uh, uh, came into the garage to stay there. But there were around 10 you know, high school kids and college kids were in a garage. So his mom put me and my friend right next to a huge uh, refrigerator, 30 years old refrigerator. It makes a really huge sound. Like a <laughs> and there were two bunk beds right next to it. So me and my friend were slept on the bunk bed. You know, my, mom, my, my friend's mom said, since you guys are in college, you guys sleep here, let the high school kids sleep over there. The thing is, I was only 16 at the time. I was high school age, but my friend's mom didn't know. Anyway, I didn't pray. I slept in the garage, but I was so happy to be there. I didn't have any family, so my uh, my friend's mom said, you can stay here as long as you want. That made me feel so comfortable, accepted as their own family. You know, Thanksgiving is coming this Thursday. Some of you told me that you guys are going to host more than 20 people. You know, hosting 20 people is very difficult. But I'm pretty sure you want your family to stay at your place, because that's love. You want to take care of your family. Stay with me. Is there any expression to show our love to our friend? You have to love this person, so you can ask, stay with me in my place. Unless you love the person you don't want to say that. Jesus says, stay with me. 
It's not just stay with me, stay within me. It's not just a temporary stay. In another version, it says, remain inside of me. It's permanent. It means you are already in Christ, so continue to stay there. Jesus has to teach this lesson to the disciples at this particular moment of his ministry because in about a couple of hours, he's going to be arrested. You know, Judas already left the disciples' group a couple of days ago after the Last Supper. Then Judas is going to come back anytime soon with the gang of the high priests and elders. And they are bring, uh, bring some gangsters carrying an uh, assaulted weapon, you know, sword and a baseball bat. Jesus knew they are coming. You know, when you look at this whole scene, it kind of makes us sad. You know, those who earned the title religious leaders are going to come to arrest Jesus Christ. They are the ones who are, are supposed to worship God, help people to uh, come across the kingdom of heaven. But instead, they are the one who kills the Son of God and prevent the kingdom of God from coming to this earth. That's why James 3 verse 1 says, Don't be teachers. Not many of you should become teachers because those who teach will be judged more strictly. Judas could come back anytime soon with those gangsters. Jesus knew that. So he had to teach this very important lesson. It's not a theological lesson. It's not really true uh, legalistic uh, Moses law teaching. It's a very simple lesson that you are with me. You are inside of me. Stay there. I am the true vine. True means here genuine, real, and perfect. I am the perfect vine. I am the real vine. I am the genuine vine that all your ancestors are waiting for. All those prophets are waiting for in the Old Testament. I am the one who you are waiting for, for generation to generation. So I am the true vine. You know the true vine statement is one of the seven I am a lesson. Actually, we have a graphic. Would you put up the graphic up there? John chapter 6 to John chapter 14, Jesus teaches this I am statement. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the way, truth, and I am the vine. Believe it or not, I memorized this when I was a third grader. You know, my Sunday school teacher, she uh, uh, taught, uh, taught me how to memorize this. So this time I want to show you how to memorize the seven I am statement, right? My Sunday school teacher showed me that you eat bread, okay, bread alive, then turn the lights turns on. Then you can see the gate. Right? Then you go out, then you can see the shepherd. And shepherds see Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus is the way, truth, and vine. Do you memorize? Let's do it again. <laughs> when you eat bread, lights turn on, then you can see the gate. When you go out to the gate, you see the shepherd. Shepherds see the Jesus' resurrection, Jesus is the way, truth, and life, a vine. So let's do it again, I am statement, right? I am the bread, I am the light of the world, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection, I am the way, truth, and vine. I'm going to ask you next Sunday if you memorize it or not. 
No, I won't be here next week. So you're lucky. Jesus teach this I am lesson. Because the I am is the essence of his kingdom. Without Jesus Christ, without the Messiah, kingdom of God is now really kingdom. It's a fake. Who is the Messiah? Jesus Christ. I am my identity. So Jesus trying to teach his disciples, you are not following a prophet. You are not following a, a social reformer. You are not following a political leader. But you are following the Messiah. I am. I am the light of the world. I am the bread. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the truth. Way. I am the genuine vine. Stay inside of me. Stay with me. This is what Jesus is trying to teach us today. You are God's children. We study the Bible. We pray. We go to the church. The reason, the sole purpose of doing all these things is to learn Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Messiah. He's the light. We have to understand who Christ truly is. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Only Messiah. There's no other name who can save us. We have to stay inside of him. He's the true vine. You know, I am, I've been doing uh, many funeral services before, and I have seen that when parents died and their kids buried them under the ground. But when a kid died, the kid's parents buried the kids under their heart. They never forget their kid. The kid died, but still kids live inside of the kid's parent, and parents live inside of the kid. They are inseparable, no matter what, forever, permanent. That's what abide means here, inseparable. You and I cannot be separated. You know, when you look at the John 15, we often look at, if you don't bear much fruit, you're going to be removed. That's not the point of John 15. Here, Jesus tried to say, you are with me. I am the true vine. You're supposed to bear much fruit. So ask whatever you want to ask, that it will be done to you. That's the main focus here. It's not a focus of removing you. That's the, uh, Jesus came with all much love and grace and mercy, so he tried to teach us, you are inside of me. You are the branch, I am the vine. He cannot be separated. Whatever you ask, it will be done to you. We have to stay in this truth. We have to live out this truth, because this is our confidence. This is our peace. This is our joy. As long as we understand, we are Jesus' branches. He cannot be separated. We have to be there. You already have much fruit. You have to reduce. You have to use your gift and talent for the Lord and his kingdom. I have seen many people at our church, they have so much gift and talent. They are artists. Musician, the carpenter, they are good teachers, they are good leaders, they are good speakers. You have to use this gift for the Lord. Because God has already given to you. So you have to rekindle the Spirit. Scripture says rekindle the Spirit. Rekindle. It means you already have the gift and talent. You already have the fruit. Because we are already in Christ. Today's scriptures say we are already cleansed by the Lord, by his word. So ask whatever you want to ask, then it will be done 
to you. That's the teaching Jesus Christ tried to give us today. You are in Christ. Bear much fruit. You are already producing much fruit, but you have to see the fruit come from the Lord. The fruit you bear from the Lord our Christ, the Savior. We are the branches. Christ is the vine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are your followers. Teach us where the true peace and comfort comes from. It's from you, Lord. Bless each one of us in this room that we are in you and you will never kick us out as long as we love you and are willing to follow you. In your name we pray. Amen.